As you may remember, cognition is basically the thought process that we demonstrate whenever we're solving problems, and that is, of course, controlled by the frontal cortex of the new brain. In this chapter, we'll talk about how we develop our cognitive skills during infancy. In this slide, you can see the various uh, mental processes that are studied by the cognitive psychology subfield. As you can see, these are things that are uh, processed by humans for the most part. Although language is processed by various animals and different species, uh, it is in the human uh, species that we are able to process and study that a little bit easier. The ability to memorize things has been studied with rats, but it's easier memorized and assessed uh, by humans. We also look at problem-solving skills, which seem to be uh, uh, superior among humans than they are with other animals, and so forth. All these various components of judging and reasoning and knowing and decision-making are all byproducts of our thought process. And the way we define thinking is basically as the manipulation of mental representations of information. That is to say that whenever you are given a formula that, for example, could be a mathematical formula, you have to make use of memory to understand that you need to maybe isolate X over here. Uh, you need to have problem-solving skills. You need to know some basic rules. You need to be able to make some reasoning, even without maybe specific instructions. Um, and you need to make a decision as to what to do. So you would then do a subtraction, right, to basically be able to do this here, isolate 2x, and you would end up with your uh, answer here. So thinking is basically a transformation of some specific information into new and different forms that allow us to make sense of problems in life. One way to make thinking easier is by making use of mental images. A mental image is a representation of an object or an event. Uh, and these are not limited to visual representations. Oftentimes, if I were to ask you to think of your best friend, you would not only get a visual representation of what he or she looks like, but you may even associate smells and sounds and words um, that are associated with this person. When I ask you to think of friendship, you have a mental image of friendship. When I ask you to think of uh, mothers, you have a mental image of mothers. Uh, schemes are also other ways that allow us to make sense of the world by having an organized body of information uh, of what we think of, of, of the world. So a scheme of what uh, getting money consists of changes as we get older. When I tell my nephew, Jaden, that I don't have money, his original answer to that was, let's go to the ATM and get some. Uh, that's his uh, organized body of information. And as we get older, we realize that it's not as simple as going over to the ATM. Uh, it's not just somebody giving you money, but you have to have money there yourself. Concepts also allow us to categorize uh, objects, events, or people that may share common properties. Now, when you think of a kitchen, for example, you know that a kitchen uh, would consist of or may be composed of uh, dishes, uh, refrigerator, uh, dishwasher, uh, you know, food, and, and this is a concept that you have of a kitchen. However, these are not necessarily universal. There are different types of concepts that are seen in different parts of the world. Uh, for example, if we were to have you think of a concept of a classroom, you could probably think of a computer projector, you could probably think of air conditioning, you can think of uh, iPads and laptops, but if we were to go to a third world country, uh, and somewhere in an impoverished area in Asia or Africa or Latin America, and ask these kids what their concepts of a classroom are, they would probably not think of classroom projectors. Uh, in fact, they may think of just a pencil uh, and uh, paper and maybe no uniforms as children there may get their barefoot. So our concepts are not necessarily uh, universal, but they still allow us to make some complex thoughts into something a little bit more simple. A prototype is a typical and highly representative example of a concept. For example, if we were to have you think of a bird, you could think of the bird that you are most, most familiar with. So if you live by the beach, you may think of 
uh, a bird in, ter in, in terms of uh, a seagull. If you live by a park where there's a lot of pigeons, then you could probably think of uh, birds and the prototype of bird as a pigeon and so forth. Anything that is representative for you would basically be an example of a concept uh, in the form of a prototype. As we get older, we begin to uh, tackle and solve problems that we were not capable of uh, in earlier stages of our lives. And one of the ways that we demonstrate that we are close to being able to solve problems uh, that we were unable to before is something they call zone of proximal development. And the ZPD is basically a state of mind or a position uh, of cognitive maturity that allows children to be able to solve problems with a little bit of help from a skilled partner. For example, if the child is trying to solve a and put together a puzzle, uh, and instead of have p having parent solve the puzzle and put it together by the parent, the parent should just uh, help them by making use of schemes, concepts, and prototypes so that they could stimulate the brain differently and allow the child to be able to find the answer or solve the problem by themselves. Uh, yes, uh, it would help uh, to have the parent there, but that also would be... Um, an advance in their cognitive maturity, a signal that the child is making progress and by being pushed to a limit, by being pushed to think for themselves, they would be stimulated in a deeper fashion and be able to make greater cognitive uh, maturation. Intelligence tests are used uh, typically by school officials or by doctors to assess whether a child needs uh, special assistance to be able to complete a task. Uh, most of them are done during the school age uh, years. However, there are uh, intelligence tests that are used during infancy. Now, because the child does not uh, have uh, the uh, skill of language, uh, oftentimes children uh, who are assessed for their intelligence during this age will be tested for perceptual and motor responses. That is, their ability to perceive things and their uh, actual movements and responses to those things that are perceived. Uh, the newer tests uh, seek to tap into uh, some early language and cogn cognition and social behavior, but these are still in the making. One of the most popular uh, infancy tests for intelligence is the Bailey Scales of Infant Development, and they're currently using the third edition. This is uh, suitable for ages one month to three and a half years of age. The test consists of three main subtests, uh, and that is cognitive, language, and motor. So a child is assessed on their ability to pay attention to familiar and unfamiliar objects. They're also asked to engage in some pretend play and are able to see if their schemas and their prototypes and their concepts are in place. Uh, the language scale uh, often uh, ask them to follow simple directions. Uh, they are asked to recognize objects and people and having them point to them. And they're also, in some cases, asked to name objects when the child is uh, already speaking. The motor scale basically assesses for the child's ability to move uh, and, and more specifically in the gross motor and fine motor skills. As you may remember, the gross and the fine motor skills are Basically, grows is anything that allows you to move big muscles of your body, walking, crawling, jumping. And the fine motor skills would be those that require a lot more dexterity. And so, buttoning up shirts uh, and handling objects with your fingers. In addition to those three other subtests, there are two additional scales that are um, completed by the parent or by the uh, guardian. And these are basically assessing the social and emotional skill of the child as well as the adaptive behavioral component. Uh, and the social emotional skill, you uh, are, parents are asked about how easily it is to calm a child when he or she is distressed or upset. Uh, they're also asked about the responsiveness of the child when in social settings. And they're also asked about the child's uh, likelihood of um, engaging in play by imitating those that are around him. When it comes down to the adaptive behavior, they are asked about the child's self-control, 
and also how easily it is for them to get along with others as well as following simple rules. Um, you uh, must consider that the child's performance in one day is not necessarily uh, representative of the child alone and their capacity. Uh, we must assess through a parental report whether the performance on the day of the exam is consistent with, with, with how the child performs and engages on a regular basis. Despite the validity and uh, relevance of the intelligence test in children, we find that uh, one of the uh, biggest predictors of cognitive development and individual intelligence in children is how the child is stimulated at home. And we were talking about physical stimulation as well as parental affection. When we are asked uh, about children's ability to perform later in life, some of the things we could uh, tie it to is how much time their parents spent with them during infancy. So we find that parents who talk to their uh, infants and toddlers often uh, give way to an earlier uh, language uh, production uh, and earlier language production uh, also gives way to a higher uh, IQ score and academic achievement. This seems to be associated with one another uh, and although we have not had any uh, experiments where we could control and manipulate a variable in and of itself, we find that um, this is associated or correlated with one another. When asked parents as to how active they were and, and stimulating their children during early life, we find that there is a uh, greater likelihood that they would score higher and have higher academic performances later in life. We also find that uh, a warm and responsive parenting style is associated with uh, how uh, children uh, will respond later in life. If parents are uh, very cold and distant, we find that children will often be cold and distant as well. Language is one of the most important uh, ways of assessing the cognitive development of individuals. We find that uh, through communication, we demonstrate our ability to remember things and we also demonstrate knowledge of the grammar that we've been exposed to. Every language uh, has a form of information through symbols that are arranged according to uh, grammar and these systematic rules. Now again language in humans and in all other animals uh, is a cognitive ability but in humans, it's a lot easier to study because we could communicate with a person, whereas with another animal of a different species, we would have to assess that in different forms. Grammar is uh, considered the language of the language, and that is basically composed of a system of rules that determines how we ought to communicate with one another. Uh, grammar in English is different than grammar in Spanish, however, uh, every uh, single language has the components of language that we'll be s discussing in a bit, just that they may be slightly different. For example, uh, phonemes or phonology uh, is basically the study of the smallest basic units of speech. Uh, a phoneme uh, affects the way we use the sounds to form words and produce the meaning. Uh, for example, if we were to look at the vowels in English, we have A, E, I, O, U. In Spanish, we have the same vowels, but we pronounce them differently. In Spanish, it'd be A, E, I, O, U. Uh, if we look at someone, phonology, uh, in, that speaks English, and we ask them to read this word here, it would basically sound as fat. Uh, if we add another vowel, to that, to those three letters, then the word of and sound of A would go from fat to fate. And these are two different phonemes that are produced from the exact same letter, which is A. If you speak to someone who speaks Spanish, uh, they would read this the exact same way, fat and fate. Uh, and that is basically, again, a phoneme that is universal, but that according to grammatical rules, is employed differently. The differences in phonemes is uh, believed to be at the root as to why certain individuals struggle to learn other languages, especially as we get older. Um, when we look at individuals 
whose first language may have been Spanish or anything other than English, we sometimes catch a bit of an accent on the individual. Uh, sometimes individuals whose first language is English uh, speak in different ways and pronounce words differently. For example, our ability to roll the R. If you are a Spanish speaker and you are capable of doing it, maybe saying the word burrito or perro or carro would come easily for you. However, if you were never exposed to that as a child and you try to learn Spanish as an adult, you would probably not have the ease to be able to pronounce that R or roll your R that way. So you may then continue to lean in toward what you know, which may be burrito or perro or carro. And uh, that, again, is what makes it difficult for us to master different languages. The syntax is basically the rules that indicate how words and phrases can be combined to form sentences. And this is very important because if we don't have proper syntax, then we may give a very different meaning of what may have happened. In the example that's provided here, on the first one, we have John kidnapped the boy. If you are a witness uh, giving a report to the cops and you say John kidnapped the boy, you are stating that John is the person of interest and the boy is the victim. If you make use of a comma and rearrange the same words on the second option here, then you say John the kidnapped boy. Now you made John the victim and it basically be the same as the boy. In the third example, you will have the boy kidnapped John. Now John became the victim and the boy is the person of interest. So syntax is essential to be able to communicate our thoughts and uh, and and statements. Semantics is basically the meaning of words and sentences. It basically is on how we could have one word that may have different meanings depending on how it is used in sentences. And some people take advantage of this in here for their own benefit. Uh, and, and in some cases, it could be as simple as the sentence here, loving to read the young girl read three books last week. Uh, notice that the word read and read is spelled the exact same way, but because of our ability to memorize and know that in English, this would sound odd if we say loving to read the young girl read three books, um, we know exactly when to uh, make use, uh, proper use of semantics. Children begin to uh, process language uh, with something that we call babbling. Uh, about the age of three months, uh, they begin to make these meaningless sounds. Um, but uh, despite the fact that they may be meaningless to us, they begin to reflect the language that the child's been exposed to. So we now know that a child who is exposed to uh, Chinese, for example, their babbling is more aligned with the Chinese language and, and phonemes than a child who has been exposed to or raised in an English-speaking uh, household. Um, we know that at uh, infancy, we can distinguish all 869 phonemes. That is the universal number uh, of phonemes that exist in all languages. But as we start getting older, we begin to specialize in the language that we are exposed to. So we begin to see that around six and eight months, children who are exposed to English language begin to organize their neurons in a way that responds to those common phonemes. So to pronounce words like perro, the child, even though they may not be able to pronounce it at the age of six or eight months, they are organizing their neurons so that when they are capable of producing that, they'll be able to say it without any problems. There is also a critical period for language development, and that is when a child is more sensitive to language cues and uh, and most easily to acquire language. You may have been, if you have kids or have access to kids, you may sometimes be surprised by the words they may use, um, sometimes even bad words. And the argument is that if they're exposed to that language, then they are absorbing that language, especially during uh, the early uh, part of their life, in infancy and toddlerhood. Children uh, who are exposed to language are capable of producing just the exact same, and children who aren't exposed to language oftentimes have difficulty overcoming the deficit even into adulthood, as we saw in previous chapter with uh, Jeannie, the feral child who was uh, confined to a bedroom without any communication with adults.
from the age of 12 months, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, 20 months to 13 years of age. It is amazing on how fast children learn uh, to use uh, words. We find that uh, the babbling soon becomes a few words, and in those words, we find that about the age of two uh, years old, uh, the average U.S. child has 50 words in their vocabulary. But just six months later, they have a few hundred words in their vocabulary, and they're able to produce sentences. And then just by the age of six years of age, we jump up from 200 to 10,000 words and skilled conversations. So we find that the production of language is very impressive. As adults, we often struggle to even learn 10 words per year. So it's always been of interest to researchers as to what contributes to this amazing language development uh, in children. Uh, telegraphic speech is basically uh, a speech pattern in which the words that are not critical to the message may be left out. So a child who may not have mastered grammar skills and who may not have a lot of vocabulary, words in their vocabulary, excuse me, they may say something along the lines of, I show book instead of, I showed you the book. And uh, this would demonstrate that they left a few of the words out, but you still understand what they were saying. Kind of like Tarzan, right? Me, genie. Uh, they don't say the uh, many of the words that we know are necessary, but the message can still be understood. Uh, at the age of three, uh, children also learn plurals by simply adding s's to nouns, and they also learn to form past tense by adding an ed to verbs. And this is uh, typically the most common uh, thing to do when we make something go from singular to plural, but we know that there are words that don't necessarily need extra S's or E-D's to make them past tense. Children who may not have mastered grammar, they often engage in something they call overgeneralization, and this is when they apply these language rules even when the application results in error. For example, a child who may have overgeneralized on uh, um, plural and on past tense, he may say he eated the cookie instead of he ate the cookie. Nonetheless, despite these two uh, common errors in children's language development, it is pretty impressive uh, what they're able to accomplish. Two theories behind uh, the way we understand language are the learning theory approach and the nativist approach. The learning theory approach follows the principles of behavioral reinforcement. And they basically argue that uh, it is through conditioning that we learn to speak. Uh, you may not remember this, but perhaps if you uh, were raised in a loving home with parents who are proud of you, the first time you said the word mom or dad, they may have reinforced you with a lot of attention and praise and hugs and laughter. Uh, and that alone, uh, according to this theory, served as a reinforcement. This reinforcement... Uh, um, made you uh, want to speak more often because after just saying one simple word you got all that attention so it makes you want to try it more. We find that the more parents speak to children the more proficient children tend to be in language uh, use. But despite this uh, uh, nice and easy um, understanding of how language is developed we often struggle to explain how children may acquire language rules. And the reason is that oftentimes parents, in their excitement because the child spoke, rather than correcting them on their errors on syntax, syntax and phonemes, they often reinforce it. If your family is like my family, we often uh, embrace the errors of uh, our little nephews and, and, and nieces, and we don't correct it at all. If that's the case, then how do children eventually overcome that and learn to speak properly? The next theory uh, seems to have an explanation for it. The nativist approach, which is a theory that is, was developed by Noam Chomsky, uh, basically states that we are able to speak because we are genetically predetermined to be able to speak. Uh, Noam Chomsky argues that there is a mechanism that directs our ability to speak. And um, one of the things that facilitates uh, this mechanism to work well is that all the languages in the world share a common underlying structure that he called the universal grammar. And that is, again, going back to our infant stages, we are able to uh, 
uh, pronounce every single phoneme that exists, all 869 of them. And so we find that a child who may have been born to Russian parents uh, could have been adopted by parents in Argentina. And since they are equipped with a universal grammar and with a, a language mechanism, they would be able to speak Spanish like Argentinians do. You could also have a, an Argentinian child and uh, by Argentinian parents and be raised in Korea and the child would learn to speak Korean with just as much ease as children who are born to Korean parents. Chomsky argues that the brain basically has a neural system that he called the language acquisition device that uh, basically allows us to understand the structure that the language provides and that allows us to use the different characteristics of the native language and that includes all the grammar that we would uh, require to be able to get our message across. For the most part, uh, the uh, discussion about language development is still very much up for grabs uh, and is a work in progress. Uh, for the majority of developmental psychologists, uh, an interactionist approach is the most logical way to tackle uh, the understanding of, of language production. And they argue that through an interaction of the nativist and a reinforcement, we are able to uh, learn to speak.